So with Gabriel, I really had pleasure to have an interview also back uh, some time ago, uh, asking uh, about experiences of facilitating building uh, online communities. So that was my first kind of introduction to what Gabriel is doing. And I was really impressed about the uh, uh, level of uh, activities, but also comprehension of what online can offer. And it was nice to hear also that Gabriel is involved in this for years, even before of the conditions we are now. So for me, it's also making it very relevant what Gabriel is ready to share. And we agreed that Gabriel will be sh uh, sharing mostly about the quality of online learning. So the time and audience is yours. Uh, for the rest of you uh, then listening, please use the chat to uh, express your ideas, questions, uh, reactions. We will pick them uh, up uh, uh, on the second half of the uh, input. And then also questions, we will try to address them uh, with Gabriel later after his input. So please, Gabriel. Thanks a lot, Nerius. Uh, I wanted to share my screen and I think I need uh, some uh, um, technical rights to do so. Um, meanwhile, I'm very happy to be here today and to discuss those two important topics, quality and online learning. Um, perhaps the last year was really the time when everyone started to speak about online learning. But uh, what I wanted to share with you today in, uh, in this uh, introduction will be also uh, what, how was online learning before the pandemic? Because what, what happened during the pandemic, I think we are more or less all of us familiar with. Um, but in this presentation, I think uh, it should be visible now. Um, perfect. So let's get it started. And also, I think there is also some uh, calm facility to collect questions uh, that can be right away visible on the screen. So if you want to drop a question over there, this is possible as well. So my name is Gabriel. I'm general manager of Jake and I'm part of the Hope Council as well. Uh, I'm working in the youth field for the last 11, 12 years. 11 years ago, I was one of the founders of Jake Community, which is now probably one of the biggest uh, youth communities in Europe and in Romania. I'm based in Bucharest, Romania. And before the pandemic, I was almost every month in one, two locations. Um, and let's start with um, what is online learning? In the past year, because everyone was in, in their house and remote work became uh, very popular, online education became the norm, and also many training programs started to migrate from the residential setting to a 100% online setting. Um, having this in mind, I wanted to clarify that in our understanding, online learning would be everything that is making use of online tools or of digital environment. That means that it can be virtual, which means that every interaction, every content, uh, every, mm, every material that you create is always virtual. For the hybrid, I think this is um, quite a, an area that uh, has a lot of um, potential. Uh, and the way I, we understand it is that perhaps some people are joining, uh, let's say for a big event, uh, everyone is uh, joining from their um, from an office. Let's say we have five people joining from Warsaw and they are in the same room. So they are physically present in the same room and they are connecting with their peers from other places. So we have, let's say, clusters, all of them physically present in one location and then they connect online and they interact. That could be one option. Another option would be that you have half of the group in person and half of the group online. And this is something that probably I'm looking forward to see this happening probably in the next six months when uh, um, organizers will try to host physical uh, activities more and more. And still some participants, I think they will not be able to travel, so they will join online. And on site, I think it's the traditional way and for this one, um, the way we use online learning in the on-site uh, uh, framework, um, for example, let's say people are working in intercultural subgroups and we are using a platform to make available some materials, to make available some templates, 
or to collect ideas from the working groups. And then when we return in plenary, we use the platform uh, that already collected all these ideas in order to debrief what happened. So as you can see from in, in these three formats, everything is possible. And then the natural question that is coming next will be, what is quality in this, uh, in this setting? Um, what, what, what do we mean actually when we are looking at quality? And uh, this is also something that we think it's very important to give an answer for ourselves as organizers of online learning, as trainers, as facilitators, as project managers. We need to give an answer for this question for the funders because um, they might be a bit reluctant to fund the online programs. And this is something that I saw uh, evolving in the past years, probably in March or April, everyone was waiting. No, let's just wait in two, three months, everything will be perfect. We will do again residential trainings. Then they saw that, okay, this is not gonna end soon. So we need to be more open and then more open. But still, I still see a lot of uh, foundations and institutions that are still reluctant to go into online learning because they are not sure of the impact and of the quality of these programs. And the third answer that we need to provide is for the learners themselves. Um, we know that many schools move to online education and they didn't have, in many cases, the best experience over there. So some of them might, might remain with this uh, prejudice that maybe the online is not the So that's why we need to come up with a very good answer also for the learners. How are we going to assure that the experience we offer is qualitative? So we need to provide answers to these three categories of stakeholders. And from our understanding, we are looking at four, four aspects. One of them is related to content. And this is something that probably I started with this one because probably this is the closest one to the residential setting. Because you plan in a similar way that content delivered. Um, you connect it with the needs of the, of the learners. What are their needs and what are their interests? Um, what is changing uh, a lot is for the question how. I think this is maybe the, the most, uh, the most uh, meaningful change because for the how, now we have hundreds of platforms. And in the warm up exercise we did before, I already saw like 10 or 15 platforms that I never heard about or never used. And if we continue to discuss about this, probably we will discover even more. And probably this is the main challenge when it comes to content, is not only what we, what we deliver, but also in which format. Uh, there are different kinds of interactions. We can use videos, we can use audio, we can use infographics, text, charts, a lot of things. And uh, perhaps this is gonna be the challenge uh, for the facilitators of online uh, learning um, to explain and to choose what is the best um, format for their own audience. And something uh, in the past year, we had the chance to deliver several programs online, some of them for youth workers, some of them for young people. And we realized that each group have, have their own preferences. So it's really important to get the feedback of the group all the time and to be able to adapt. Your group might tell you that uh, there are too many uh, meetings, video, uh, simultaneous uh, video conferences that you're planning, and they prefer to uh, work more uh, asynchronous. So if we are listening to, to the learners and we are flexible, and I think he, here uh, I'm also taking advantage of the presence of the, uh, uh, many of you are representing national agencies or working with national agencies, um, or some of you, I'm sure you have also experience in working with other funders. We need to put flexibility in the contracts and in the, uh, in the approach we have, in the sense that if we plan, let's have 20 online meetings and our group is saying, no, we don't want 20 online meetings. We want seven online meetings and we want this and this and this. We need to be able to adapt to that and to deliver what they want. And this is something that there is no recipe and we can start in one way that we believe is good and then be open to, 
to adapt it to the to the needs of our learners and to also to their digital skills. Uh, I notice also some online programs that are pushing toward using five or six digital tools every meeting. And this is too much. They are just can they just cannot follow so many interactions. So if we switch too much, we might uh, leave some people behind. And here I would like to include also in, in, in this qualitative uh, um, criteria, it's also about inclusion. Um, we need to make sure that the content we propose is inclusive for our participants. The second uh, thing is related to, to the interaction between the learners. And uh, for, for the interaction between learners, this is something that we learned uh, um, even since 2013, when we started our first online programs, um, this is a very powerful experience. And when we, when it comes to inter, we, when it comes to non-formal education, young people and youth workers, they prefer to learn in an intercultural environment because they have the chance to talk, to experience, to work together with people from other countries, and. Um, this is a, an important component that uh, we are looking at uh, when we design online programs, how our learners will interact. If we compare to the on-site approach, I would say that the most difficult part is the informal moments. When they are on-site, they have coffee breaks, they have lunch break, they have their own free time, they organize themselves. But when everything is happening online, uh, this interaction in terms of informal moments is a bit harder to do because everyone is busy. Um, there are some breaks, but people maybe they need to uh, have a shower, go to the toilet, have a phone call. So I, I see this a very uh, big challenge on how to do so. Some uh, programs are proposing a sort of digital warm up. They, they gather participants in a group. Uh, they allow them to share, to introduce them, each other, and to start already interaction. And I think this part is really important because when they feel comfortable with each other, they are uh, able to share more than, than before. They are um, able to offer more. And uh, I think in the programs I was involved, we were always looking at 40 to 50% of the, of the experience in online learning to be true interaction between learners. That can be maybe opening some forums or some debates in the whole platform. This can be maybe uh, sending them in breakout rooms and let them discuss and brainstorm about different things. This can be about uh, setting up teams and working collaboratively on an article, on a project, on a follow-up idea, something like that. Uh, so when, when we measure the impact of our, uh, of, of our online learning, the level of interaction that we can achieve, I think it's a measure of success. So the more interaction we have, the more, um, let's say, products, outcomes of these interactions are behind uh, um, our uh, online learning, it's, uh, it's more qualitative. The third is related to follow-up. Um, the follow-up, in the follow-up, we are looking at what our participants can do better after they finish our experience. And we dedicate probably 10 to 20% of the time to already think or prepare what's coming next. This can be a personal or professional development plan. So for example, last year, we, uh, we, uh, we facilitated in the whole platform Digital Youth Work Academy. And in the last week, we, we created a sort of an action plan in which the participants uh, reflected a little bit on what happened during the program and what are the three things they would like to do next in the next week, in the next month, and in the next three months after they finish this experience. Um, and um, we think this is something important for, uh, for every online uh, learning program to have, to show that there is something after this program. And I think this is a good answer also for the funders uh, because often the funders want the programs that they support to be sustainable. Sustainable in the sense that they create effects afterwards. So I would suggest that always let's find a way to measure this follow-up. And if we have enough resources, it's good also to follow up their follow-up plans 
in the sense of asking them after one week, uh, did you do what you wanted to do after one week? Did you do or do? Uh, and if we or, or use online platforms, uh, this is, can be done also in a very simple way. You create a poll and you let them um, vote on that poll. I did this, I did this, I didn't do that. And so it's something very user-friendly. I don't recommend, let's say, the more aggressive approach of uh, calling them, emailing them, chasing them. Then they will feel pressure and they will uh, abandon the, the program. The, the following thing is related to relevance. Um, perhaps it's sometimes even more uh, challenging to, to do an online learning program because participants are coming with diverse backgrounds. This is something that we as trainers, we are used to do that. To that. We always know that participants will come from different countries, different age, different professional status, different studies, different experiences. But now with online, it comes another layer, different level of digital skills. And with this layer, it's a total different story. So sometimes when I'm in a team, I, I am the advocate of digital inclusion. I'm always an advocate for let's use less platforms. Let's make sure everyone can follow. Let's offer support in the chat in case someone has troubles. Let's jump on a call to show them around. If they have uh, technical difficulties, if they don't know how to set up a microphone or camera, let's support them in the chat. I'm always in, in a team, I'm the advocate for this part of digital inclusion, because I think this is crucial. We cannot promote inclusion in our programs. We cannot speak about, let, let's don't let anyone behind. And then when it comes to digital, we tell them, oh, if you don't have an account with this provider, you cannot use this platform. So this is something that is very important. The level of digital skills, um, I would say that my digital skills, in my opinion, is at a medium level, average level. Um, that's, that's why I always find a, a appealing to, to learn new things. And I love technology. I will always like to discover new platforms, discover how they work, etc. But I also realize that not everyone is like me. There are people that don't want to discover new platforms. So they will do the minimum. Um, and uh, this is fine. I don't think digital skills have to be for everyone. Uh, and if we manage to focus in a program for on one, two, three platforms, this will be the best because the, the participants will be able to, uh, to take the most of them. And for the ones that are really curious, uh, something that we started even now in the warm up is, I think, is the way, to, the best way. Uh, we just provide more links, more solutions. We maybe create like a, uh, a log of resources, like a registry of resources. And who is interested, they will go deeper. Or maybe we we'll set up a breakout room where they can uh, go more in depth. Um, we need to make a space where participants uh, become resource persons. So they uh, either facilitate a workshop have a presentation, um, have their own space on the platform where they can introduce their organization, project ideas, cooperation, good practices. So we need to make the platform that is also about them, not about only, not only about us willing to push on developing some skills. When it comes to the evaluation, probably many of these methods are familiar with you. I would like maybe to emphasize a few of them. Um, these digital platforms allow us a very good uh, tracking facility. We can see how many people register, how many, some platforms even show us this module was um, attended at 70%. Uh, this um, task has been done by 20 participants. So we have some numbers. However, we need to put uh, also context behind those numbers because I noticed that um, Numbers are not telling the whole story. There are participants that they are not fun of staying online all the time. And they are the best and the most engaged participants when it comes to online meetings. So when, when it's a meeting, they are 100%. When you tell them do this in the online platform, it's more challenging for them. And this is fine. So first suggestion that I will have is let's put context behind the numbers. 
Um, when we work in a team, we always do qualitative evaluation between the facilitators. I think this is something very common. Uh, meetings after or before each uh, session, uh, discussing a little bit how it went and how it can be better for the next time. And this can be also linked to the daily evaluation that we uh, we have um, our participants that can be done uh, to different platforms or even with emojis. Some um, video conferences also allow more emojis. Zoom, I think it allows about five or something like that. Others uh, allow more emojis that show um, how we feel at the end of the, um, at the end of the session. Uh, tasks are also a way to measure the impact, to evaluate uh, how, how was your uh, uh, program perceived. Um, and another thing that uh, we learned is that not all the tasks are relevant for all the participants. So in order to cope with that, we usually propose a 70% completion as being satisfactory. So I propose 10 tasks during the program. You choose yourself which, which one are the seven that are the most meaningful for you. Can you do those? Um, because it's impossible for the facilitators to design everything. Um, master group sheets, this is something that I would like to, to point out. I, find, I found them very useful also for the on-site trainings. Um, a master group sheet is, imagine, um, let's say a Google sheet that has several sheets, one per group or could be a jump board where every group is collecting their, their ideas. And for the facilitator, this is very useful because they can monitor very easily what every group is doing in the same time. Uh, and I think this is very good to track the, pro the progress. And if we speak about um, an online virtual uh, learning program, if you see that uh, maybe one group is still not contributing anything to the master group sheet, after 10 minutes or after 15 minutes, you can join their breakout room and see maybe there is a misunderstanding or maybe they lost a lot of time to discuss, but still there is no contribution written down. So you can go there and help. And this is extremely useful, especially when there are more than one facilitator and usually there are two or three. One of them can remain in the plenary room and the others can go and support where, where it's needed. The last one uh, that I wanted to emphasize is the gamification. Uh, and uh, linked to the gamification, we also have a success story that we started uh, in 2013. It's called New Media Ambassadors. Uh, it's a program uh, that you can learn more at jake.ro/nma. Um, and the elements um, that makes it special is, uh, I think the most important is the gamification. So the participants uh, being rewarded with uh, points for the, um, for the task that they are doing, and also to motivate them to finish the program. Um, we, um, we gave a type of, uh, of merit for the ones that got the best results after 12 weeks of program. Um, what it, what it, it was interesting about this program as well, was the fact that we welcome uh, young people all over the world, as long as they had basic uh, knowledge of English and uh, an internet connection at least one time per week. And when we started this in 2013, this was a little bit inclusive. And I'm saying a little bit because there are still countries where having internet access one time per week is a luxury. Uh, so not everyone can, can afford this to, to happen. And um, at that time, we didn't use video conferences. They were not popular at the time. I think Skype was the king in those areas. We didn't have so, much, so many platforms. But even if we would do it again now, I would think several times before using Zoom because, or another video conference platform because it might leave some people behind. Not everyone could, could be able to join a video conference. You need the uh, to be able to join a video conference like that. So sometimes when you want to make it more inclusive, you need to um, maybe when you choose your platforms to take into account, this, is, this needs uh, access to database. If we need a lot of band, we cannot use it. This needs video, we cannot use it. So sometimes we need to also make some choices. 
we want more variety, we want more interaction, we want more colors to be more um, appealing, more interesting, or we want to be more inclusive. Sometimes they are not coming in the, in the same way, in the same direction. And I think the last thing, uh, the last aspect that I wanted to share before uh, seeing if you, uh, what are your questions will be um, some dilemmas that I wanted to share with you, um, which I don't have necessarily an answer. First of them is the digital divide. Uh, do we feel that the online learning programs are helping us to bridge the gap, the digital divide, or is making the gap bigger because more people will not be able to join because they don't have device, internet connections, skills, etc. Gender equality. Um, ITMC field was used to be associated with male experts. But now with online learning, do we feel like even more girls could get involved? They can, could have professions related to that. I, I had the pleasure to see a lot of online facilitators, female, which is really great. And uh, I would like to see them more also as um, creators of these platforms, of these methods, of these approaches. Learning roles. Uh, yesterday I joined a debate about the future jobs and the future skills. And someone said that um, teachers will disappear. And uh, I said, I agree with that. Teachers will disappear, but it will disappear, not, not necessarily their name or their role, but their traditional uh, format. The teachers will not be the teachers that we had when we were in school. In 10 or 20 years, the teachers will need to be also teachers in online learning. I don't think teachers can avoid any more online learning. A few years ago, they still believe, okay, I'm too old for that. I don't wanna do that. It's not possible anymore. And I'm really happy to work with teachers in Romania uh, that uh, even though they were not born with internet, they really embrace it. They use a lot of digital tools in their class. And this is really, really impressive. And the last aspect is related to digital transformation. How can we actually use online learning to to push towards the digital transformation of the organizations and um, how we can um, make sure that the, the organizations are benefiting from these online programs they are attending and they are able to transfer to their organizations. Because I saw a lot of people registering that they see fancy names, they like how it sounds, they subscribe to different, they register to different platforms, to different courses. Maybe they even follow those programs, but I don't really see the transfer to their organizations. And this is something that I think is part of the qualitative approach we can have in mind when we design programs, how much of the program can be transferred to the organizations from where they come from. I'll stop here. Thank you, Gabriel, a lot for uh, your thoughts, uh, ideas, and uh, uh, input. Uh, meanwhile, I was following the chat a bit, and uh, uh, at least Sebastian was very active with uh, questions. One thing what uh, Sebastian asked, maybe, uh, if you could share examples of uh, uh, free uh, platforms for online courses, and then also clarify what do you mean by uh, platforms uh, yeah because it was conversation uh, also we where Mikhail is, was joining that we should maybe differentiate between platforms and digital tools yeah so if you could respond to this one and meanwhile the rest of the crowd uh, I invite you to think of questions or discussion points uh, to add and you either can easily unmute and say it or just post in the chat and I will voice over um, I see also a comment uh, from Michael in the chat. Uh, I agree with this uh, differentiation between platforms and digital tools. Uh, when I spoke about platforms, I always had in, had in mind, let's say the get around. If in an on-site um, approach, the place to get around would be the training room, let's say. In a digital format, you need a platform where always the learners, they, they know that they will come, come back there. So that, that platform could be in, 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 
it's right, could be Zoom, could be Hop, could be Classroom. Um, Moodle also have different formats. Hop platform is also based on Moodle as well. Um, and in these main platforms, we are using different tools that we, we would like to uh, use at a certain moment to create a specific type of interaction. And I think it's fine like that because every facilitator is able to choose what kind of plugins or what kind of tools they would like to use in the main platform in order to create more. And now the, the, the digital standards are also going towards um, compatibility. So we are able to work in one platform to embed it in the platform that we are uh, using as the main one and maybe to export some of the functionalities that are specific to another digital tools to export it and to embed it into the platform that we are using at that moment. And um, I think this is the, the approach um, that, um, that makes sense for me. Um, and for the gamification, um, let me read the question. Yes, um, I, uh, I can give you the example of the media ambassadors because I went very fast seeing that the time is, is getting um, is getting is going up. Um, for the media ambassadors, we combine both competition and collaboration. Um, every week, the participants had to do several tasks. Uh, some of the tasks has, uh, were done uh, individually. Some of them were done in teams, and some of the tasks were also involving cooperation between teams. So, and um, they were uh, evaluating each other and giving feedback. So the way we can uh, give more, uh, more focus on collaboration than on competition is by um, uh, appreciating with points the collaboration process. So if a team is supporting some other team, then you give points to the, to the team that support it. Um, if, um, if they work well together as a team, then they uh, the, the teamwork could be as important as the final result. Because I've been also part of, of the uh, student projects and many times I had to choose, do we want to work together or do we want the best project as a team? And sometimes the two of the two aspects were not always compatible. And uh, this is something that um, I started to learn more in the past years, that sometimes we need to set up realistic expectations as um, uh, online learning facilitators and realize that it's more important to have everyone involved sometimes than the final result. Because what is the stake? We, we are not fighting to be the next uh, $1 billion startup that we really need to the best results. We need to make sure everyone can contribute and have a say. I see one more question from Finland. Thanks, uh, Irene. Peer learning is used a lot in youth work. Um, and how can we make this happen in a qualitative way regarding online activities? Uh, one way that we always uh, use uh, is we invite participants to give feedback to each other. Uh, and at the end of, of last year, we did um, a program called Project Management Academy with uh, youth workers, uh, actually not only youth workers, with civil society representatives from the Black Sea region. Uh, and um, for example, one of the tasks they had was to share a SWOT analysis of their own organization. And we use peer learning in the sense that uh, we wanted to make this SWOT analysis public between, uh, between the participants so that they can share uh, each other, um, share with each other a feedback. Um, we realize that there are participants coming from the same field, from the same background, or from the same country. So when it comes, for example, to opportunities and threats, perhaps they are sharing the same opportunities and threats if they are coming from the same region or from the same country. So uh, peer learning is really powerful because they can learn from each other, um, and also they could discover things that maybe we as facilitators, we cannot offer. So that, that's, the, that's the magic of, um, of non-formal um, education based on the peer learning approach. I'm not sure if I missed any question. 
No, I think in terms of questions, uh, you covered them all. And unless somebody else would like to unmute and just uh, voice uh, viewpoint or, or ask, uh, that would be time to do before we say thank you to you. <laughs> all right. So thank you very much, Gabriel, for uh, your input. Uh, really, it's valuable in my uh, subjective opinion, and I hope that was also useful for uh, participants of this webinar. I also kept sharing a certain the most recent experience of uh, being involved in situations where certain things we need to decide and do in terms of online learning. Uh, you mentioned also in chat about the role, changing role of educators and uh, also role of uh, le uh, learners. I want to post one other uh, resource which we follow a lot lately. It's uh, uh, by Institute of, for the Future, and we developed uh, the concept of lead learner, where young people take the leading role in creating new pathways uh, to work and, and learning. And I find this very interesting because it's based on interviews of young people across the globe and with some insights from experts. So I would like you to do a little bit of uh, finger gymnastics. Have you heard about this new uh, field of sports in Olympics? It's, uh, uh, it's really a new one because now, as you know, sports also are getting a bit uh, in lockdown. So the only thing what people can actually practice from physical, it's typing quickly on keyboards. So that's where you need your fingers to be trained to do things. So what I will ask you to do, if you can, go a little bit back from the screen and then I will try to put uh, fingers in front, yeah? And uh, we will start from very light exercise, you know? Uh, it's called finger magic. So you basically have two fingers and it will be uh, one of the Olympics for finger gym gymnastics is to jump over the gap, yeah? So you go one, two, three. You see, one finger jumped over, yeah? Now it will be a bit of teamwork of two fingers jumping over the gap, all right? So be, be very, yeah, so one, two, all right. And then you can practice even more creative jumping. So wherever fingers want to jump. Wow, three fingers appeared, only two. If you think this doesn't work with adults, try doing that with uh, as young kids as you can, and magic will happen. You will see wonder in their faces. How come two fingers manage to jump over from one hand to another? If they will not wonder about fingers jumping, they at least will wonder how stupid this adult is showing these kind of strange tricks on fingers jumping yeah so in any case the, the success is guaranteed uh, uh, kids will wonder all right um and uh, uh, today we will be a bit wondering because uh, i was uh, sending a couple of uh, activities uh, before webinars in between webinars uh, trying to keep your attention to uh, quality of online learning. So in a number of emails, I was including uh, two activities you could already engage. One was a uh, Mentipol, where I wanted to uh, think about quality from different perspectives, uh, facilitators' perspective, funders' perspective, and uh, also uh, learner's perspective and Gabriel was also nicely touching on this that it might be difficult sometimes to convince uh, funders about certain approaches or practices of online learning and training while we truly believe that this would be beneficial to, uh, to learners uh, but at the same time sometimes we fail to acknowledge that learners might have a different perspective yeah or we are able to do that and then incorporate their perspective so Menti was uh, inviting you to look at quality from three different perspectives, uh, learner, funder, and uh, facilitator. And uh, uh, now I will launch it again, because uh, so far we received uh, uh, around 9-11 responses. So it means that we can try it again. And uh, 
if you yet didn't contribute, I will put some music because it takes time to read statements. So uh, by reading statements, I will invite you to respond uh, to uh, ranking a bit as facilitator. What do you think, which quality criteria are really most important to you as facilitator? In the next ones, because you can, can move to the next slides, you will see perspective of uh, funders and then learners. So it's an individual re uh, reflection more. So I will put some music back and then maybe 10 minutes or so, I will start showing the results on Slack. I also posted the link in the chat. If you already did uh, this exercise, uh, you can again rethink on different quality uh, areas of online learning. Online activities are accessible and user-friendly. That's one of the most important uh, consideration. Then online learning activities are relevant for participants' context and online learning activities are participatory and learner-centered. So that would be the criteria which are most really uh, important. And then maybe least would be learning achievements in online learning activities are shared with the wider community, where is a continuous exploration of remaining and emerging challenges and management and facilitation of e-learning activities. Yeah. Uh, I know that it will not be finished fully for the funders, but let's see how this will change for funders or remain the same. All right, so what for facilitators seem the least important quality criteria for funders, it's on the top level. Then online learning uh, activities should be accessible friendly, both share on, on very high level and then relevance to the context. So I think what's interesting here to think is how we can bridge that huge gap, if you think, how we can, in a way, uh, ensure that what uh, people learn uh, on our courses are actually transferred to wider communities and shared. Uh, so, and personally, it means for me also how then what we learn together can produce as a tangible outcome and already spread around. So that's one thing. All right. And uh, then I will go to learners and see where learners are. Again, it's still your perception. So it would be always interesting to ask learners directly. But nevertheless, it looks like that three groups really meet on the accessibility and user friendliness. And then one which is going up very much that learners are involved, engaged, and it's particip participatory enough. And then relevance still uh, makes it uh, high on the uh, importance level. Good. Uh, that's one exercise uh, I wanted to do with you together today. And I would like to continue to the next one, which will be on actually on a different platform. And this exercise will be continuation of uh, reflections and exchange in terms of uh, quality criteria. And for this one, I want you to go on the platform which allows people to express opinions online. It's called consider.it or consider it. Let me share as well the way it looks. And here you will have a few statements which you can actually add extra statements uh, if you want uh, opinions from others to know. And these statements should be somehow related to quality of uh, online learning. So I came up with several uh, based on the document, which was hard to send to me. So when you are on this page, you can click on the specific one, and then you can give your opinion, and then even argument for your opinion by leaving a post. Well, it looks like that from your responses, it would be really good discussion points to carry out because you have quite diverse opinions coming up. Maybe this one is getting towards 
more agreeing, but the rest, they are rather perfect. Where do you stand exercise? Then we need to look at how do we reflect and evaluate quality of our online learning activities? Who is involved? How? Uh, what criteria we use? Uh, so different, different questions around the uh, quality reflection and, and evaluation. And one thing what we discussed in our team, maybe you still want to kind of differentiate a bit what kind of formats you're talking about, because certain evaluation practices and reflection practices might differ depending on what type of course you speak about. Maybe if it's blended learning course, maybe we'll apply uh, different criteria than compared to uh, online only. And if you are missing a format, you can add and add the color and then later on color code different uh, uh, inputs you make. So what I invite you uh, to do is in breakout rooms, uh, have a conversation around the quality. How, how do you reflect and evaluate quality and uh, post some ideas on the Padlet, which I'm sharing now in the chat. It will be around good 25 minutes for doing this. I saw quite many contributions coming into the Padlet. And now what I would like to invite uh, is actually to voice something what you want in terms of discussions you had. So something what you say that was interesting to hear, that was important to hear, uh, that's the aspect I, I maybe didn't think of, or I take, take this one with me for sure. So it's very open and I invite anyone to share a bit. Yeah, Katya. Uh, I really uh, underlined for myself this point uh, after our discussions in the course. Uh, when you go through the course, there are some assignments that you need to do. And first uh, uh, thing that I uh, took for myself is that find out who, what kind of learners are enrolled in the course. What what people are looking for. Are they looking to, that uh, they make connections or do they want to do it on their own? And uh, what's their expectation of the course? Just straightforward asking them. And in our conversations, I realized that even in our small group, there are people with different approaches to learning with different expectations. So it really is very important to, first of all, ask what kind of learners are in the, in the course. That I will take with me. Thank you. Anyone else wants to share? Irene, please. Yep. Uh, we had a quite interesting discussion in our group number three. Thank you, Yasmin. You opened my eyes once again. That's one of the best things of these learning sessions that uh, you start to talk with each other and you get eye opener because we talked a lot about the quality and how to in make sure that you can include everyone. So it, it's accessible and including. So you don't have to think about, okay, I, I, am I a person or participant that, for example, can take part in a, a training course like this, but I don't have mobility otherwise. So what kind of activity are I excluded from? Mm -hmm. And some other is also that, is there any kind of language barriers? Do we have a common understanding on the topic, uh, the content in general? And also that, uh, well, I think it's, it's a little bit what Katya also said that we might have to have an APW for online trainings also. You want to add anyone from our group? Lara, Yasmin, who else was in our group? Yeah, I would like only to, to speak about uh, Katya, what she said before about the profile of a learner. I would like to say, be careful, because if you do selection, or not in inclusion. If your content is not adapted about your learner, it's your fault. Why the learner will be excluded? 
I don't know, it's open, but for me, I don't want to make a selection of participants because it's not that Erasmus. That's all. See some agreements already expression. So if you really uh, agree, uh, you can also express it through either reactions or showing if you're using camera. Good. Yes, smiles from Irene. Anyone else wants to, to share a point or two? Me, I would like to ask you, Michael, or you as a professor. No, no, really, I don't find the solution. I don't know. I never do e-learning training, okay, as you know. Uh, I don't do virtual activity with youth people, not yet. Uh, but I have a problem how to include during e-learning training the problem of the languages. Because normally when I am in a training course with my user, I'm near them for to translate what they don't understand. But now if I do that online directly, it could be difficult for the other participant to stop the dynamic and how we can I don't know. I don't. I don't know how it's possible to help the participant. They are not near me because they are online, but in the same time, no, no block. Wait, is that? don't block the, the dynamic of the course. I don't know if you have a solution. Yeah. So uh, I will post at least for Zoom uh, uh, where is a, a possibility to have interpretation where you have a special audio channels for participants of different language abilities. So at least for Zoom, it's less one. If it's more educational content, it will be a more translation of that uh, as subtitles or voiceover, which is more technically maybe difficult. But I invite anyone who has this solution or many solutions, because it depends what you are actually using, to post this in a chat. And then, yes, mean you could uh, take the links. But good point. And I think mm -hmm. in a special international context, we will be exposed to these questions. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, um, it is Zoom has also this closed cap caption, this automatic one. If you if you make them on, you have them, but they're a bit tricky because they are automatically generated, and some things are kind of not not right. In the context of let's say uh, midterm meeting and on arrival trainings, the question of language uh, is uh, that we we introduce an activity speaking about the activity and about the instructions. But we have also the instructions. Uh, first, we have it in Polish and English. So we have it already prepared, uh, the instructions in two languages written. And we post the kind of instructions in the chat. So those people kind of, even if they have pro problem or trouble with it, they can copy it out of it and put it into a translator and, and, and grasp the thing. And I saw also participants make it the other way around. Even, even some people who struggled with English that they kind of, they typed on their phone in their own language in the Trilingus translator one sentence and were trying to read out the English sentence then via microphone, yeah? This is, um, it's, it's still, it takes a little bit of the flow. It's, uh, it's slowing, slowing you immediately down, but um, I think you need to develop an awareness for this, that kind of, if there's a group silent, it might be language difficulties. It might be kind of um, assertiveness. They kind of they don't want to speak up or in the microphone. Um, so so, but but you can handle it. Yeah, this is but you have to slow down with your 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 speed a little bit. Yeah. Uh, there are a couple of more posts uh, with ideas. Also, Juan is asking about anything similar to uh, Google Meets and so on. Uh, I think we still may need to search for, for solutions. I think language will be one of it, them. I'd like to, connecting with what uh, uh, Jasmine mentioned, we, we, we must not forget we are under Erasmus and the key word under Erasmus is inclusion, not quality. Despite the fact we, are all, we like to use big words such as quality, success, a successful activity, uh, we must remember Erasmus was designed and conceived to include all kinds of people. Uh, and that's the reason why, I mean, if you understand quality for uh, synonym as a, being inclusive, that's one criteria. So it all depends which sides of the fence you are standing on. If you are a giver or receiver of training, if you are a giver, you are a trainer facilitator, you are expected to provide statistics, outcomes, indicators if you're a receiver i mean if you're a learner 
you are content with what you get from each session. I don't know if I make it myself clear. Yeah, I, I think very much to the point. And if, if you look into quality criteria, I was sharing a bit in advance in the email, inclusion is one of the quality criteria, participation, engagement, it's another quality criteria. So I think when we speak about quality, at least in the non-formal education sector field, we uh, often refer to uh, maybe less, uh, how to say, less metrics like numbers and so on, but rather what does it give as impact process uh, benefits to end the learners in a way, participants. So uh, that's for sure. Uh, Meta is asking Tomek about uh, Hop platform. Uh, does it have an opportunity to translate the platform to different languages? Maybe that could be interesting to address as well. Yeah, and we had it a bit uh, during our study visit uh, previously. So in the recording, there is some uh, little discussion about it. So uh, we have examples of courses that were developed in other languages than English, uh, but the interface was in English. Um, uh, and for the owners, creators of the course, that was fine. Uh, but also we have this possibility to have the interface in other languages and so far we have it in Polish and English. Polish was a bit of experiment uh, how this plugin will, will work, but it was quite successful. So in principle, if there is uh, several courses coming in one language, which is not English, then we can also add an interface in that language, but probably we will not be able to add interface to every little single training coming in different language. So we would need to see a bit of uh, more interest towards it. 